Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 151. Today I'm talking with artist Anastasia Morozova, who has an incredible story to tell. She's currently travelling in Southeast Asia, sharing her travel sketchbook about the people and places she's seeing through her adventures. In our conversation, we talked about Anastasia's career journey from the classical art education she received in Russia, to studying a master's degree in France, to moving to Italy, to transforming into a freelancer and digital nomad who now helps others find their own creative paths. Let's listen. Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you, Bethan. Thank you so much for inviting me. I am very much looking forward to unraveling your story with you and learning some more about your your history and the amazing life that you're living right now. I, I really love to go back in time and I find it a really connective way to uh, to start to know my guests by knowing about their connection to nature and creativity in childhood. And I know that you have a, a really interesting story growing up in Russia and your connection with nature in early years. I'd love to hear some of that, some of that experience for you. Of course. So as you say, everything comes from, from childhood, a lot of things, I think. So, so it was for me, um, as you said, I'm Russian born, so born and raised in Russia in uh, in a big city but my parents owned a house in the woods for my whole life basically and i used to spend a lot of time there during my summer holidays and during all of my childhood and this is the place for me that really impacted my life a lot so it's um it's a place in the middle of nowhere you know there's a river forest and it used to be my playground when I was a child so I used to spend all of my time outdoors playing with plants observing animals lizards frogs you know so Mm -hmm. uh, I was really connected to nature so since the early years of my childhood and this is something that impacted my life I think so um yes I you know walking barefoot watching animals living their life uh, knowing how to recognize the plants or mushrooms was really important for me. And I think in, in my culture, it's still, you know, n- no matter what is your social class, no matter how, what kind of, you know, your income is, everybody goes foraging mushrooms and berries, things like this. So this was very much part of my um, my childhood. And that's why when, you know, I was thinking about my creative path and what I want to focus on, nature was a no-brainer for me. So basically, this was the most natural thing that uh, I could do. (laughs) That's so delightful. And were there particular people in your life that acted as mentors for this loving of nature? Were there people that you looked up to who modeled this and showed you what to find in the forest, that sort of thing? Yes, of course. So first of all, my family members, so my parents, my grandmothers, um, they taught me a lot about nature and what plants to avoid, you know, what plants are edible and mushrooms and everything. So of course, first of all, uh, my parents and my my grandmas, I think. Um, And after that, yes, I think I was just surrounded by people who love nature in general during my whole life. (laughs) Now my, my husband also is pretty much into nature as well so we do these like foraging experiences and nature walks together so yes I think this is something that comes across my whole life and (laughs) yeah this is how it is and creativity were you were you always interested in drawing even when you were a child I was um when I was a child I think I, I was always pretty much creative so maybe it was not always drawing or painting but it was making something with my mm-hmm. hands so I was always making something for sure 
And then um, again, my my dad is a creative as well. So he's not a professional creative, but he is a creative in heart. So he he was the one who told me like the basic things about drawing and we used to play together. Uh, he used to show me some, you know, playful exercises on how to develop my fantasy, these kind of things. And I think this this uh, this presence. So my my dad influenced my early early years, and um, which kind of allowed me to think what I want to do in the future. And the only thing possible for me was something related to creativity. Yeah, and I love I love that your path was so clear that your because a lot of people finish their high school studies and then hmm what do I do and maybe take a gap year and whatever it's not it's not always clear for everybody but I I love I love that no no go ahead (laughs) no no I was just going to say that I love that your path seemed obvious or or that there was no other path for you it seems obvious but it's not you know okay I mean, when I'm talking about my path, everything seems perfect and like, oh, it perfectly aligns with what you're doing. But I want to reassure you that um, it it was, I had a lot of detours and uh, weird things going on. Tell me the story. Tell me what happened after that. When you, when you were choosing your studies and then in your career development, tell me that story. Yes, of course. So as I said, um, nature and creativity was something that was with me for, you know, since the beginning, I can say, Mm -hmm. but I, you know, this question of who you want to be when you grow up, Mm -hmm. I, I I had no idea how to answer (laughs) this question. So maybe because as children, I think we're pretty much influenced by, you know, the society and what it is available there for you. So you don't think necessarily about artists as a career path, right? And your loved ones, your family members, does not necessarily encourage you to take this path. So um, I was always interested about languages as well. So I started to learn English and French when I was uh, still a kid. So this was was one of the options for me as well. I thought maybe I will do something related to languages, like a translator or you know other job related to to other languages, which was also exciting for me. Mm. And really the choice I think came up when I was 16, 15 or 16, because it was time, you know, to choose what I want to study in the university. And uh, I think this was the time I said, okay, I want to do something creative. And again, my parents really helped me a lot to um, develop my skills because in Russia, we have a pretty good um, education in terms of arts and we have a, a good art schools very classical ones, but, uh, you know, in terms of knowledge and foundation, it's really good. But the criteria to get there are quite high. So there are quite high standards to get in these uh, schools, public schools. So they are free, but you need to be prepared to be able to enter these schools. So that's why when I was 15, it was really time to, you know, start to... (laughs) um, to get ready for these exams, because usually when you choose an art path, in Russia, at least, you need to do it way in advance. So it's basically like becoming a ballerina. You know, they say you need to study, ah. you need to start studying really early. So it's kind of the same thing with arts. They say you need to do a school like art school for children. After that, you do art school for, you know, adults and so on and so on. So my, you know, me starting at 15 was considered very late. It was considered like, oh, wow. you will never be able to do it. You know, I had teachers that told right away, oh, just forget about it, you know. But this was the only way, the only thing I could think about. So I pursued my path and in two years, uh, you know, preparing myself for the exams, I was able to to pass them. And I didn't pass the exam for the school I wanted to go to, um, but I did the exams the next year and I did pass them. So I had two attempts (laughs) for getting where I wanted to get, but... Yeah. <laughs> so this, this is it, incredible that you are schooled um yeah like in ballet or maybe gymnastics to this is what you do early on and yeah. I have never really thought about that that this could be such a strict and stringent entry criteria and and that sort of thing. Did you feel a lot of pressure when you were there? Oh Did yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah <Okay>. definitely. <laughs> As I said, like Russian school is a very classical, very traditional school. Not mm -hmm. all of them, but the one I was in uh, is. So to be able to enter there, you really need to come there prepared. So you know, you need to know how to draw and paint realistically already. Otherwise, yeah. you will not be get, be accepted. Of course, then you perfection your skills and. Yes, you know, pressure is always there because even though you pass the exams, you're there. So it, it means at least you're worth something, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the studies were hard, you know, especially the first years. Um, but I was passionate, so. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So then you f did your formal art training and then I think you moved on to something like art management or something Exactly. That, yeah, so, tell me about that story. This is where my path started to get a bit <laughs> divergent. <wonky. path>. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, um, again, the art education in Russia is six years. So six years studies. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. That's, that's like a, that's a for lot. medical training or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I know. Wow. So it's it's four years to obtain like a bachelor. But in my art school, there was no bachelor. There was just like it's six years or nothing. Wow. So um, to obtain like a real diploma, you had to do full six years. Um, at the end of my fourth year, <laughs> um, I really enjoyed, you know, the studies and everything. But I think what the art school in Russia really didn't give, and I think most of the art schools in the world don't do this, unfortunately, is to prepare you for the real life. So you study, you spend a lot of time developing these skills a lot of your you know mental physical efforts to get better at something to really master this craft but then when you get out of there you actually have no idea what to do so what to do with it yeah interesting I, yes like i was looking at my um like the older students of the academy and i was kind of watching what they were doing and they all struggled so it was very discouraging because i thought like what what is this for you know if I just waste six years of my life and then I have no idea what to do with it and I will you know go and find a normal normal job somewhere this is just a waste of my time so encouraged by my mother because my mother she was okay with me doing arts and everything but I think at the end of the day she was more happy if I was doing something else so she was like yeah you were creative but maybe you will do something more business related like let's try art management or something like this or art history you know and I was very passionate about art history in the art school because we have this as a topic of studies as well so I thought, yeah, art history sounds amazing. Uh, this is something I like. Why not trying, you know, this path? And I almost like uh, my parents really allowed me to travel a lot when I was a teenager and a kid. And um, my dream since, you know, I was a, a teenager was to go living in Europe and especially France. This was the country I wanted to go. Um, so I started to search for, uh, first of all, actually, I started to search for art schools in France. So my first attempt, attempt to go in France was still related to art, like to, you know, creativity, but I failed the exam <laughs> again. I failed the exam. So the next year I decided, okay, I will do something else. I will do art management. Um, so I got accepted to the business school. So art management school in France. In France. Wow. Yes. In Paris, France. So they actually accepted my four years of studies in Russia. So it was considered as, um, uh, as Credit bachelor already. So, mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. So I, so I already had bachelor for them and I did my master's degree in France in wow. contemporary art management <laughs> and art history. Did you already speak fluent French at this point or did you I have did. to learn that on the go? Okay. No, no, I speak, I, I, started to learn French when I was seven so at okay. school but I had to prepare myself to real life again yes, so yes, I, took, yes. I took some courses before moving there but yes I was pretty much fluent and my studies were in French wow. um, but yeah the first year is always challenging you know you have you think you you, you know how to speak and interact yes. with people but then <laughs> when you come there it's a whole new story <laughs> and I'm sure formal language about different like specific topics to do with art management and oh gosh yeah I mean this was a challenge but what is what was more more challenging is interacting with my peers because the okay. language they are using is not the same as you know you learn in courses or in in, yes. a, in a school so a lot of slang and uh you know, understanding their humor. <laughs> I yeah. had a, I had the impression I was like, oh my God, I'm so lost. <laughs> 
But, you know. What an amazing adventure. Okay, so uh, you studied a master's in France. And then what was the next step? Yes, the next step. So I was living in France, um, doing my internships there. So I had zero working experience. But fortunately, my studies... um, you know, encouraged, highly actually forced us to find this experience. Um, So I basically accepted any working opportunity possible. So any kind of internships, paid or unpaid, everything. And at one of the internships, I met my husband, my future husband. (laughs) So my husband is Italian. And um, we met uh, at, he was, he's in culture as well. So not in fine arts but in in cinema so he was working at the cinema foundation at that time and I had a guided visit there that I had to like accompany and this is where we met so um, two hours two uh, years later we got married and we decided to move on so Paris was an amazing experience but we felt like we wanted to move forward towards nature actually Mm what the reason why we moved from Paris was that I think we were tired of the busy life uh, primarily and then this way of living you know you work in the morning you go to work uh you earn money you go Maître back home you sp- exactly <laughs> oh you speak also french a little bit <laughs> amazing exactly Metro <laughs> boulot that's the one so um and then you earn money you spend everything so like you know it's it's a hamster wheel <laughs> that we yes. were a bit tired of and we realized that every single free, you know, weekend, we were not enjoying the city, but we mainly tried, tried to escape and, you know, go to the forest or enjoy nature. Mm-mm. So we, we thought, like, maybe it's time to move somewhere to, you know, experience a better quality of life and be more in contact with nature. And my husband is from the south of Italy, so from Apulia region. It's like the, the end of Italy. <laughs> Yeah, and wow. the um, we we thought about different places to move, maybe Spain, maybe somewhere else. But at at, um, at the end, Italy was the easiest option because um, his parents have a house there, so an empty house that basically allowed us to stay there without paying the rent, which was Amazing. a good thing, you know, if you need yeah. to start a new a whole new path. And we had to do it because we were conscious that if we move there we will no longer be able to pursue the kind of careers we had in Paris because there are like the cultural sector is not very well developed in the south of Italy so we had to do something else so um, did you speak Italian at this point or is that something you had to learn you did okay no no actually I started to learn with my husband so before him I did not speak Italian and I I had no idea I will end up in Italy (laughs) yes but um, I'm really passionate about languages. So when I met him, I started to learn and, you know, in, in Paris, reading books and everything. So when yes. I moved to Italy, I, I was already speaking Italian, but it was still a challenge to, yes. <laughs> to learn that. it the proper way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what a huge adventure. So this is only the start of your story. So you have now started forging a career as a freelance artist and entrepreneur Tell me about this leap, making the leap from f- from a formal job uh, to being a freelancer and what that looked like for you. Sure, sure. So again, the transition was gradual. So a lot of people think like it happens to you overnight, but of course it doesn't. So mm-hmm. in 2017, we moved to um, to Italy and it took me one year to figure out what I wanted to do actually. So I tried different things. I tried video editing, photo editing. A lot of things. Um, did some internships. Uh, in 2018, um, actually everything started with a personal project. So my mom was turning 50 and I wanted to give her a special gift. And we were celebrating her birthday in Holland. So it, it was the season of blooming of tulips. Oh, and wow. tulips are favorite flowers of my mom. So I said, okay, I will paint 50 tulips for her, you know. <laughs> and it was kind of a way of starting a creative project for me. And this first project and this constant painting, I think, really allowed me to dive deeper into botanical illustration and the world of, you know, nature illustration, botanical illustration. I started to make some research online on Instagram and I realized that it was actually a huge community, you know, of people learning it, teaching it and passionate about it. 
And this kind of opened a world to me. So I said, okay, I will open my, you know, Instagram page and we'll start to share what I have to share without any, you know, any expectations, basically. So I knew I wanted to do it professionally, but I just started with an Instagram page and um, decided to see how it goes. Uh, the first years were were hard. So I was not earning anything, of course, <laughs> when I would just started my freelance journey. Um, I still had some, you know, savings and because I left my job in Paris, I had like the, not the prime, but how do you call it? When you leave a job, then you have like the system that supports you in uh, for a certain period of time for you to mm-hmm. get an, a, a different job and everything. So mm-hmm. we had this mm-hmm. and then, you know, slowly I started to get my first commissions and my first clients. So for, for, first of all, it was selling my originals or doing commission pieces. And then I, st- I opened an Etsy shop, started to, to sell my prints and stickers and original pieces as well. I learned pattern design. I started to transform my hand-painted illustrations into patterns. So I started to, you know, get clients uh, for that as well. Um, in the beginning, I was also working another job, so it was hard. <laughs> and um, I wanted to travel, so I thought if art galleries are not available in Italy where I live, I will contact a gallery remotely and try to, um, you know, get hired for doing art fairs. So this was something I enjoyed doing in Paris. Uh, And I found a gallery that allowed me to travel the world and do art fairs and, you know. um, Tell me about what an art fair looks like. What, What is an art fair and how do you get involved in it? Yeah, this is a whole new topic, but I will tell you real quick. So an art <laughs> fair, it's like a trade show for okay. for, for art. So I was in mm-hmm. contemporary art and it means uh, it's open, like the good fairs are open only for galleries. It means that gal- galleries from all over the world can um, uh, buy a stand, so purchase a booth at this fair. You know, there are many fairs all over the world. And this is the place where galleries and collectors meet. So uh, galleries are there to show their artists and collectors come there to buy art or curators come there to find new talents and, you know, all the people involved in the industry. And I was responsible for actually selling art of other artists. So I was, um, you know, the person who was talking to people and explaining the work of artists, selling the work of artists, take you know, Uh, collecting contacts so everything involved in the public relationship during the art fair which I loved I mean this is something I did in Paris and I enjoyed this so much so this gallery um, allowed me to to travel Europe and uh, a lot of different countries in the world so it was like two parallel projects for many years so me being an art manager basically (laughs) And me being an artist myself. So I had this double um, double path that was mm-hmm. really confusing for me, you know, because I was switching, switching identities, basically, which was, I know, made no sense for me. But after, after you know, later on in my path, it started to make sense <laughs> when I started to teach what I, what I know. But in the beginning, it made totally no sense. Um, but I enjoyed both. So it was really hard, you know, to to decide which one to take and um, I was developing both. At a certain point, uh, uh, one or two years ago, probably over a year ago, there was a moment when, uh, you know, things started to go better for me. So I had my social media following grew up significantly and uh, I started to get more exposure, more commissions, more clients. I started to teach. So first on Skillshare and then I launched my own course And this is where things started to get faster, you know, Mm -hmm. and my husband was someone who supported my project since the beginning. So he was always helping me always. He was always there. But with the courses, he started to get involved in the project more, um, you know, more significantly. And uh, over one year ago, we decided that he will quit his projects for my project and he would start to work on my project full time. So this is when we started to work together as a couple. And this was the moment to decide, I think, which path to choose, because it was no longer possible for me to do to continue to do art fairs. So unfortunately, I 
had to decline a lot of, you know, these opportunities to focus fully on my project. Um, and here I am. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh, and, and so now you've, you're on the road. You're, you're doing this from Southeast Asia. Right now you're in Malaysia. Yes, is in that Malaysia. Correct? It yeah. is correct. <laughs> yes. So it usually... Usually on my podcast, I ask my guests to describe, you know, nature around them, where they live and what they see. But your nature is changing constantly because you're changing countries, moving from place to place. It you're a digital, doing this on the road as a digital nomad. Tell me yes. about that. Tell me more. Of course. So traveling was something that me and my husband, like, this is one of the things we love most in life. <laughs> so already traveling for art galleries, you know, was this way for me to make this come true. But with our project, basically, we realized that we can work from anywhere because watercolor is the medium that I can easily bring with me on trips and nature illustration. I don't I don't do huge formats. So the biggest formats I'm doing are basically A3, something like this. So it's manageable from anywhere. I don't have to necessarily have my studio to work. And for the courses, same thing. I just need my laptop to record, you know, my laptop and some of my gear to record the lessons and to um, sell the courses and provide my services, you know, for my students. So we realized, okay, we can actually do it from anywhere. Yes. <laughs> and after COVID, so during COVID, um, Italy was locked down, like completely locked down and everything. And it was a very challenging time for us. And after COVID, I think we said, okay, when this stops, we just yes. want to travel, you know, we just want mm -hmm. to go. And uh, because you never know what will happen tomorrow, you know, uh, another pandemic, something else, let's just do it now, because otherwise, we, like, we have only one life. Okay, so let's just, let's just do it. Yeah. So we just bought the tickets, one-way tickets. and um, Where was we, your initial destination? Initial destination was Thailand. So okay. we spent the first month in Chiang Mai, which is uh, northern Thailand. And we wanted to start with something like more stable. So we rented an apartment for mm. one month. And we had some job to do, some, some work to do. So we wanted to be more like in one place to mm -hmm. be able to manage everything. And then the plan was to go to uh, Laos and Cambodia. And from there, no idea. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, at least we knew Southeast Asia. Um, and from there, yeah, this is where they, like, you know, we started, we embarked on this adventure. So we crossed um, uh, land uh, border from Thailand to Laos, same for Cambodia. And now we flew to Malaysia where we are staying for another um, week or something <laughs> and then Indonesia amazing I'm so glad that you are here with me it's a big deal that you made time to in your in your of life course, to, it's to be a pleasure. here <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenge you know to organize everything um, yeah. for the internet for the sake of internet connection because yes this is the exactly. biggest challenge so we, <laughs> we have to do a lot of planning you know for mm, taking care of this thing and then, yeah, so this is when I started my sketchbook journey also. <laughs> yes, so your travels also become part of your work because you're sharing reels and photographs of your travels, your travel journal online, and each of those gives a snippet and an insight into what you're doing now, but also how people can keep a travel journal. I'd love to hear about this journal project and sketching every day and that sort of experience that you're having. Yes, of course. So um, initially, before leaving to this trip, I was for the over five years, for, for six for six years, yes. I was focusing mainly on nature, so natural subjects, plants and animals, maybe landscapes, but um, yeah, travel sketching was never on my you know on my list. <laughs> but when we decided to leave for this five month trip, it was very natural for me. Like I was like, oh, it would be so exciting to actually document this journey in a, in a diary, like to to illustrate in a sketchbook. So I started in Italy, actually, I started to practice a little bit because mm -hmm. some of these subjects were out of my comfort zone because I'm, I'm very comfortable with plants and animals and these mm -hmm. things. But, you know, sketching 
other things or landscapes or people is people. more challenging. Mm-hmm. Even though I, I did this in art school, but um, I had to, you know, remember how to do it. So I started to, to um, practice a little bit in Italy and I started to do it full time during the trip. So I gave myself this promise that I will make one sketch a day, no matter what. Mm. If I'm tired, if I'm whatever, I will still do it. Um, but the rule is that it's not, I don't have to judge myself for the quality of the sketch. So I, mm-hmm. it can be ugly, it can be anything. <laughs> I, uh, I can use any kind of medium. So today I want to sketch with watercolor, fine. Tomorrow with pencil, it's okay. Liner, so anything. Um, and yes, any kind of subject. So basically anything that inspires me, anything I want. Uh, and this is how I started it. And I started to share it with my audience. And I had a very warm, you know, response from my audience. I was not expecting yes. it because sometimes, you know, when you transition from one thing to another, you never know how your people will react. But I think that was this was something that my audience was kind of expecting from me. Because a lot of people were saying, oh, and uh, how do you do like landscapes or but hum- what about human beings or like what about travel sketching? So I think it was a natural transition for me and it was something I truly enjoyed at this moment because I think only plants and animals at a certain point started to be a bit limiting for me mm-hmm. as an artist. Mm-hmm. So basically, yes, I'm really happy that this my desire for more creative expression really combined with the warm response of my audience so you know I could not wish for better. (laughs) I think it's delightful because when people are following you following along with your travels and then seeing that burst onto the page as as a sketch it hel- it it's like we can be part of the travels with you it it draws you into the travel experience and that's that's a really lovely thing for someone to be to be able to do along with alongside you yes i think so and a lot of people say like oh my god you inspired me to sketch daily yes. you know and yes. oh next time i will go on a trip i take my watercolors so so many people actually started to you know hopped on this train of daily sketching and again this was not planned this is something that happened by itself but I'm super glad you know because people are writing me from every part of the world saying you inspired me to you know do my sketchbook project and I'm enjoying it I'm getting better so what can be better you know my goal is to to make people understand that sketching painting is for everyone so it's not only for the chosen ones or for the talented ones or for those who have time you know because these are just excuses so you don't have to have hours a day to start your sketchbook yeah this is really good a, a good motivating insight and I'm wondering because you were doing your work privately for commissions And now you're on the street, you're doing your sketches on the street or uh, in a bus or wherever, out front of of a monument. And people must approach you every day and want to see what you're doing. And I wonder if, I wonder how you approach that and does it feel intimidating or are you completely used to it and comfortable with it? Sure. So this is the topic I think a lot of... um, artists are afraid of, you know, being watched, being observed. And when I started to make a couple of reels on this subject, I saw a lot of people saying like, yeah, this is totally me. I'm so embarrassed. So I used (laughs) to be like this as well. When I was in art school, um, we already had to do some plein air sketching. So one of the exercises uh, during the second year, I guess, was plein air sketching. So I was going out and sketching when I was, you know, 19 or 20. So, I mean, I was fine. At that time, maybe it was a bit more embarrassing. (laughs) But um, now it was fine. I just started, I know some, when a lot of people are are staring and watching, maybe like, I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to make a mistake. (laughs) It's it's going to be horrible. But then I say like, (laughs) yeah, whatever, like five minutes from now, they're just going to go away and forget about me. So like, there's no point of worrying. And then uh, people are actually usually very nice. So they, a lot of conversations started this way. Like kids start, you know, to approach me and say, oh, it's amazing. Or like adults start to talk about like, oh, are you a real artist? Oh, how are you? Like, how is it going? Or I even exchanged some contacts with people this yes. way, you know? So 
That's yeah, beautiful. It's usually a very nice experience. <laughs> I I know that people say this particular phrase, which is "you're so talented." And no. <laughs> after after six years of heavy duty study and all this practice and practice and practice and practice for your for your whole life, this word talent must seem so silly. I'm I'm just wondering what because art is a skill. Art is something we develop, and you've developed yours over so many years. I'm wondering what's your response to this question or this statement you're so talented <laughs> yeah i absolutely agree with you uh this is a very uh under uh, over overrated thing <laughs> in the art world so i, I yeah. think basically this is something that people that are not really into arts usually use because when you're an artist you know what it is right <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so you, you don't say just or oh, you're talented Yes. So, of course, I think talent exists and there are people that are more gifted than others. Like for anything, you know, some people naturally run better than others or naturally sing better than others. So it's useless to say talent doesn't exist. So talent exists, but it's not everything. Absolutely. And I think your motivation, first of all, so your desire for learning, your passion and your work, so you're constantly showing up, this is what will make you a yes. good artist, not the talent, because talent is not enough. And so no matter how talented you are, you can be genius, but if you're not doing anything, you will not get anywhere. So for sure. And, and the and opposite is true, I think. Sorry, I interrupted you. I think yeah. the opposite is true that you don't have to start with any talent at all. You can start with, you can start from zero. And if you put in those my pencil miles if you put in that effort over the years you get you get so far just from yes that. absolutely I'm convinced in that and actually my first real teacher so before I entered the art academy I had these two years of preparation studies and I was really lucky to find this teacher this woman who was convinced that anyone can draw or paint so she she had this kind of a mindset and this was quite rare because a lot of pe teachers really turned me away saying like, oh, no, you know, you're too old for it right now. Or like, <laughs> you're, you're not, yeah, at 15, <laughs> you're not too talented or you are, you're something, something. And she was the one who was like, yes, of course you can do it. Like, no matter who, like if you're young, old, like this is not, it doesn't matter. It's just practice. So yeah. basically this is what what it is so practicing is of course one of the best ways of getting better and also I think for me having this teacher really opened my mind mm -hmm. and I think this kind of guidance was really crucial for me at the earliest stage because without her I would just abandon this path you know if some if one more person have told me it's too yeah. late or you're too something I would have uh, given up probably so I'm really grateful for her to you know, saying, yes, of course it's possible for you. <laughs> yeah, that's so significant. I think in our life path, sometimes there's just one person who just says the right thing or takes us under their wing or, yeah. or just encourages us in the right way that that gives us that motivation to keep going. I love that you had that one teacher. Yeah, it was important. And then this is what I actually try to do for my students because yes. I had this kind of figure for myself and I know how important it is to to be, you know, to be motivated, or to be pushed, because a lot of people around us will say you're not enough talented, or you're too old, or your paintings are not nice, like, you know, criticism, especially the one without any kind of experience behind is very frequent, <laughs> unfortunately. And even, you know, very dear people around us can sometimes hurt us saying mm -hmm. these kind of things that they don't like really how to say maybe they say it just without any weight without to, to it mm, without mm. thinking but I know it really hurts <laughs> a comment yeah the, this is the flip side of that person who can encourage you uh, the flip side of that is that a, a flippant comment or a comment a throwaway comment that someone says can actually really wound you and I I see that in a lot of my students in nature journaling workshops that they might have remembered like it's seared into their brain this comment that a, a flippant art teacher in primary school or a, or a parent or a 
an adult in their lives has said and it stays in their brain Mm. and all those 40 years later that person of course doesn't remember saying it but the things we say to each other are important so I love that you are mindful of that with your students that the right encouragement can help people keep going. Yeah, I mean, of course, if if something is wrong, it's something. If something can be done better, I will say it. But I will say it in a gentle way, and I will, you know, not not like, oh, this is just ugly, you know, because who wants these kind of comments? This is non-constructive, and this is not leading anywhere. So even if I want to lead them in a certain direction, if I know there is room for improvement, I will say it in a way that is constructive. Yes. And I mean, my teachers were usually like this. So I was very lucky with my teachers in the art school. So rarely, very rarely, I had someone who was just, you know, making rude, <laughs> r- being rude or something. Yeah. So everybody was really respectful and their best interest was making us become better. Mm-hmm. But um, yes, I know like sometimes, especially people that are outside of the art world, I think are tending to be more brutal with these Mm-mm. kind of comments. Yes. Like, I don't know, your friend or your relative saying, <laughs> yes. ah, this is not that pretty, you know. <laughs> yes. Yes, I understand this very well. So I would love to talk about, because you're in Southeast Asia, you're seeing things that you have wanted, seeing places you've wanted to visit for many years. I know that you've been yes. sketching things that you've dreamed of seeing, and I would love to hear you describe what that's like to have envisioned yourself in a place and now be sitting in front of a monument or whatever it is that you have dreamed of sketching and here you are yes it still feels unreal to me so basically dream came true like yeah. you know uh it's a cliche but it's, it is what it is and a lot of these places such as Angkor Wat in mm-hmm. Cambodia but even you know markets in Thailand I, I sketch everything, so everything basically that inspires me, and this is, I mean, this is awesome. This is, nothing can be better. <laughs> I mean, um, I was really craving doing something. I'm really lightened up because during the last years of, of my, you know, freelance career, I was working on a lot of commissions, and I was working on amazing projects, actually, but for other people. So mm-hmm. it um, it was very, you know, it was well paid. I was happy with my clients. My clients are the best. But it's still, you know, you are doing the work for others. Yes. And I had really, there were years I did zero to little personal projects. And this started to, you know, to, to have a weight for me. So I mm-hmm. said, okay, I really wanted to focus on something I want to do. And this sketchbook journey was the answer to it. This is what was one of the reasons, you know, so I said, it's very natural. I can do what I want. I can share it with my audience and, you know, I can use this content to uh, develop my brand, to develop, you know, my, to my skills, you know, everything. So it's like everything felt into one place and this sketching journey, you know, it allows me to do everything. It allows me to promote my work and I'm, you know, I'm actually attracting more interesting clients now with this journal, uh, travel journal journey than before. Yes. But a lot of people say like, but how do you actually like sell these things? Like you cannot sell sketchbooks, right? So what do you do? But there are other ways you can collaborate with people or so. Yes. I mean, I'm using this, this sketchbook as just a personal project. So it, I had no intention whatsoever to, you know, monetize it. But I think, when you start to do something you really love and you really enjoy, you start to attract the right kind of people and opportunities. So it sounds like magic, but it is like this. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. And I'm wondering, I always think a lot about nature journaling, but also particularly travel sketching, that the act of putting that thing on the paper helps you remember in a really visceral sensory way where you are what you were feeling and and to capture those memories and then when you look back on them it's so real and they sort of burst off the page do you have this same experience absolutely even now looking at the pages from the from the first month of Mm -hmm. the trip I'm like oh god yeah this was over there you know even now it's it's exciting and I mean, from years from now, it should be even more exciting. So for me, it's like having a photo journal, but like yeah. a photo album, but better, you know. Better. So it's, it's like your memories poured onto pages. And yeah, that's why I think 
a lot of people are actually attracted by travel journaling in general and journaling in general because you don't have to travel the world to start, you know, a sketchbook journey. You can just yes. document your everyday life or plants in your garden or just, you know, things during your nature walks, anything. But it's true that these like, these paintings will hold really special memories. So for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I very much believe that travel, the, the, the feeling that we get when we're traveling, which is that our eyes are wide open, we're really receptive to what's going on, we're curious about the culture and the things yeah. we see and the shape of the buildings. I really believe that that's a mindset that we can take with us wherever we are, even in our hometown. Absolutely. So for sure, yeah. I mean, this is something that... I think I have I had already well I mean I mean I live in a beautiful place I live in Italy so I have nothing to <laughs> complain about you know so inspiration is everywhere you know yeah. everywhere uh, but no I think no matter where you live you can still find inspiring things around you or you know purposely surround yourself with inspiration so if you like mm -hmm. plants but it's winter where you live mm -hmm. I don't know, you can go to a botanical garden or like yes. try to find the ways of actually seeing things you love and experiencing things you love um, and be curious about the world around you. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me on a day you've committed to sketch in your sketchbook every day. You get to the end of the day, you haven't done it, you've remembered, oh, I need to sketch today. You're tired, you're uninspired, but you're still going to do it. What do you do and what do you, what sort of subject do you look at? What yeah. material do you reach for? <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, this was my kind of situation for the last days because okay. I had, yes, we had a lot of... Um, uh, road to do we changed country and I have a lot mm -hmm. of stuff uh, going on in my in my business so I'm launching launching a couple of you know free courses now and I have my students and I have my commissions now and personal projects so uh, it's a lot of <laughs> things on my plate and you know there are many days right now that <laughs> I am at the end of my day it's 1 a.m it's or it's 1 30 a.m like yeah. yesterday like yesterday and I'm like oh my god I need to do my sketch <laughs> and I and I do it like usually I I go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, I, and I go to the bathroom because you know I don't want to wake up my husband or if he wants to sleep I don't want him to <laughs> necessarily take part in this thing. <laughs> I just go there and I take my phone and I take my art supplies and I sketch something. Yeah. So so basically at this time I say okay uh, if I'm really really tired like yesterday I say okay I just do a pencil sketch and I will color it tomorrow so I will yeah. do like a preparation drawing for of something that I want to do. And I finish the drawing now and I color it tomorrow. So this is already yeah. okay. Or if I feel, if you know, I can color the drawing that st I started the last day. Or if I feel like it, I can start something completely new. And sometimes it turned out really, really well. You know, the, the strange <laughs> thing about this thing is that one of the best sketches like, that I like the most in my sketchbook turned out after these sessions when I was completely uninspired, tired, like I would rather not do it, but I did it. And I was yeah. like, oh, wow, this is actually nice, <laughs> you know? That's so great. I turned out liking it. <laughs> yeah, I really like that, that you've given yourself this structure and the discipline because discipline is really hard and it's easy to commit to a project, but it's really hard to do it some days and that yes. you've just like – even if it's three in the morning and I'm sitting on the floor of the bathroom, I'm going to do it. And there's something really great about that, the rhythm of it. And that, yeah, sometimes the best things come out of pushing through those hard moments. Yeah, not usually, but sometimes they really do. And yeah. I think what people underestimate are small, short amounts of time because mm. people say, oh, what if I have two kids? Like, you don't understand. Mm. What if I have my life? Yeah, we all have our lives, but do you have five minutes to scroll on your phone? I guess, mm -hmm. yes. So it, you mean, it means you have five minutes to get your pencil, just a pencil, and sit down and do something for five minutes or one minute, no matter. So, And if you do it every day, this will already bring you far away. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> what are your favorite things to take with you you've got obviously got a travel sketch kit I'm really keen to hear about what is it what supplies do you use use watercolor but what what kit do you have what do you take with you sure so everything 
was an experiment for me. I I've never did travel sketching before. So before mm-hmm. leaving to this trip, I kind of knew what I would like to use. But I, of course, I took more art supplies than I needed <laughs> just to be safe, you know. Yes. But I will tell you what I'm ending up using on a daily basis and what I will take ne- next time. Like, I will not take the other things. Mm-hmm. So my mm-hmm. sketchbooks, I uh, before leaving, I bought three sketchbooks by Moleskin. Mm-hmm. So just watercolor sketchbooks, normal ones, like the long ones. Mm-hmm. horizontal format um, I love them so I love the format I think this is my favorite one I also tried square ones but I prefer mm-hmm. horizontal ones I think they give more flexibility um, then my watercolor sketch uh, set so this is probably the most frequently asked question so I have this small foldable palette that I uh, clip on my sketchbook and one side of the palette is filled with color so there are little pans that I fill with my own colors And then on the right side, there is this little area to mix colors. So this was like a last uh, minute purchase (laughs) that I did before leaving. Actually, I I was not planning to bring this palette. I just had my regular watercolor set, you know, like um, the metal box Mm -hmm, with the mm -hmm. lid where I mix colors. This is what I usually used, but it's quite bulky and quite heavy. So I thought maybe having this small palette will be a nice way, you know, to have it just in my bag all the time. So I gave it a try. I bought it and I was not sure I will like it, but I ended up loving it. So I am absolutely in love with it. And uh, there's only 15 colors inside. So I picked the colors I'm using most frequently. So I have, Mm -hmm. of course, I have primary colors. So blues, um, yellows and reds. These are my must-haves. And then I have some some greens, some browns um, and some other colors, you know, I tend to use all the time. And yeah, so I thought maybe using the right side of the palette will not be handy, you know, because the space is really small. Mm -hmm. I'm used to big palettes, you know, when I work at home. But actually, I found a method of how to make it work. So I use a lot of I I use a little spray bottle. So Mm -hmm. I have a little spray bottle that I use to clean my brush. So I basically rub my brush against the surface of the of the palette and then I do it a couple of times I dry everything with napkins or an old cloth something like this and then basically it's that's it so I don't need to have a water container where I wash my brushes because it's heavy of course and it's bulky so this spray bottle plus napkins method really allows me to carry a really small amount of water with me and usually it's enough for one or two sketches Um, and then yes if I have like the a lot of very dark color on my brush I will first clean it with the napkin and then then I will wash it you know so there's like kind of a process there that may sound a bit complicated but it's actually not when you start to do it it gets automatic and what else as for my brushes um, I have a brush by a Russian brand the Nevskaya Palitra White Knights mm-hmm. So they were really kind to send me some of their brushes to test. And I loved this particular brush. So it's a mix of um, synthetic hair and uh, natural. So it's uh, Kolinsky and uh, synthetic. Mm -hmm. Number four. So all the details. And I use this brush for everything because it has a very nice chunky body and this uh, very pointy tip. So I do everything with it. My big strokes, my finest details, everything. Yeah, I just love this brush. Does it um, fold into itself? Is it a travel brush with a lid? Yeah, or is it... of, of course, unfortunately, it's not. So I need okay. to be careful. I, I kept the plastic lid, mm-hmm. which is pretty, it's quite big. So um, I just keep it on every time I don't use the brush and I try not to lose the lid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not a foldable one, unfortunately, but it's very light. It's And it's. I just love the, the, the way, you know, it creates the stroke, so... It's wonderful when you find that brush. You find your brush. Yes, but you know, I was not, I was really not picky for brushes at all. Mm -hmm. For the, for botanical art, like, you know, plants and animals, I could paint basically with any kind of synthetic brush with a sharp tip. I would paint with brushes that cost, you know, one dollar, no matter. So the brush was never a priority for me. So I think paper is really important. Colors are important, important, but brushes were not important. But for travel sketching, I think it is important to find a good brush that you are comfortable with. Yeah. And so you have 
we've touched on it, but I'd love for you to dive into it. You have a signature course, Make Art, Make Art with Confidence. And yeah. I would really love for you to explain what people could find within your course and how people can get involved if they're interested in learning from you. Of course. So Make Art with Confidence is a course that I launched uh, a year ago, or no, more than a year ago, almost a year and a half ago. And this was um, kind of a response for me to people that were enough of tutorials. So basically, mm -hmm. of course, I started to teach uh, with tutorials. So I first started on Skillshare and I was showing a step-by-step -step process of how to do something. So how to paint a mushroom, how to do this or that. But I realized that people that want to pursue, you know, art as a career or maybe want to do it more seriously, like find their own style, do something they want, not necessarily something, you know, they see other people do, then they need to learn a system. So a tutorial is not enough here because anyone can repeat after me because I know how to teach you, right? So I know the, the process. I know uh, what is the step-by-step -step actions you need to take to get a good result. But when you will try to do something similar with your own subjects on your own, this will be different. And this yes. is because there is a lack of basic skills and basic knowledge. So by basic knowledge, I mean um, how to mix colors, how to understand color theory, composition, um, how to actually sketch, so how to draw, because a lot of people think they want to paint, but they actually need to learn how to draw <laughs> first, yes. because you cannot paint something without learning how to draw it. And so on, perspective, if you want to do travel sketching, especially these kind of things. So there are a lot actually of things that goes into being comfortable with doing your, making your own artworks. And I thought I wanted to make a course that has it all so the foundations but then also you know the basic techniques the the the, the process of the skills um up until finding your style so i think finding your style is a big milestone in, in a career of each artist and of course it doesn't happen overnight so it involves a lot of practice but also uh, i think there are techniques that can help you to develop this style and I learned some of them from my dad, you know, with playing uh, as a child with uh, our little exercises. A lot of them I learned uh, at the art school. Some of them I learned um, when I was forming myself because me, myself, I took a lot of online courses, in-person courses from other artists. So I strongly believe that we never uh, end learning. So I still learn. And a lot of the techniques I learned along the way, I put them in my course. And then I brought this experience even further to those who actually want to take this path as a career. So to yes. those who want to maybe um, get a part-time income from their art or even full-time income. So I also teach how to market your art, how to promote yourself online, how to sell your art both on and offline. So this is where my expertise in art management comes into uh, into the place. So this is where my whole path started to really seem cohesive to me, you know, because before it wasn't. But with this course, I thought, okay, I have this large spectrum of expertise that I can now put into one program that I strongly believe really helped people to um, you know, develop their skills, develop their style, monetize their creativity. Um, and yes, yeah, so the, the course is available uh, once a year with a mentorship, um, with my mentorship. So it means it's a three month experience. So 12 weeks, we have uh, over 35 hours of, of recorded content. So there is uh, there are video lessons and exercises. But alongside that, we have biweekly live sessions where I show exercises, where I show um, sometimes I do webinars, so it's, it can be different. Um, we have a, um, a community, so a private community where people meet each other, people uh, connect with other you know, fellow artists, which is always amazing. And then, uh, of course, lifetime access. So this is the, the version with mentorship that happens once a year. And next session will be in fall 2024. So um, the enrollment will be open in October or November. And now we are currently in self-learning version, which mm -hmm. means it's more affordable um, and you get the exact same content as in the big, I mean, in the mentorship course, but without the guidance, without feedback and without the community. 
but people that are enrolling now and then realizing I actually want the mentorship, so I actually want the support, they will be able to upgrade with a discount and take part in the full experience in fall. Um, so this is the course. That sounds absolutely amazing. I love that you've got the foundational skills, but you've also got taking it to the next level, finding your own style, but also how to market yourself, how to get it out there into the world and make money and make this into something, a flourishing career, if that's what you want to do. I love that it spans all of those things. It, it does. It really does. And my goal is, as I said, not to make you repeat blindly after me, but I always encourage to apply what you learned in the course to your own creative practice. And um, yes, also in the last two modules, so the course is divided in modules. So there are six modules and last two modules, uh, there are guest experts also involved. So we have other artists, we have art um, curators, we have gallerists. So yeah. I really wanted to give the students the inside view from the professionals of the art world so that they can have an idea of um, the point of view of the people that actually commercialize art. Because as I said, what, what, what I was lacking in the art school is the understanding of what to do after. And I, especially, you know, self uh, taught artists, of course, they have no idea what it is like to sell art or what it is, the art gallery, how an art fair works. Yes. <laughs> so this is where I explain a lot of these um, things and concepts and give them tips and um, guide them like towards which direction they can go. Because there are a lot of opportunities for artists to earn. Like, I think we live in an amazing time where we have internet, we have social media, Yes. You know, we are lucky to live in this time as artists. And but I think the downside is that there are just so many things you could do that you can easily get lost in which path you need to take. Yes. <laughs> so I especially with the mentorship version, I really try to direct my students, each one of them, because it's a really personalized approach to understand where their strengths are and what like where they can go so if you are going to the gallery maybe your peer needs to develop you know uh other things maybe you know do book illustration so mm -hmm. we're not the same we're not doing the same art mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing is that my students are all very very different so different age groups different countries i have students from all over the world um, and also different backgrounds. So some of them paint for their whole life. Some of them started, you know, last month. <laughs> yes. And they're, they're all together, you know, and all of them have something to share in their own unique approach. So I think it's really enriching to, to find people uh, that share same passions as you because creating art can be lonely if you just do it alone in your studio <laughs> yes the course sounds incredibly comprehensive and personalized and i think that's really important as well i'm going to leave links to where people can find out more about your course in the show notes for this podcast thank anastasia you. thank you so much for joining me i'm absolutely in awe of your story and i just can't wait to continue to watch your your journey and your travels unfold thank you again for being here with me thank you so much beth and thanks thanks for having me and i wanted to also tell you my compliments for your project it's incredible what you are doing and that you are encouraging people to uh, develop their creative skills and mind for nature and uh, it's it's amazing <laughs> thanks for doing that it's been so good to connect thank you again thank you I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Anastasia. I was really blown away by her story and the adventures her life has led her through. Right now she's on the road sharing her travel sketchbook. It's something you really have to see for yourself. So head to the show notes and follow the links to her website and Instagram where you can follow along. Also, if you're interested to learn more about her signature course, Make Art with Confidence, you can find the link in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Mm -hmm.